you very much. Thanks for inviting me and welcome to everyone. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, I assume everyone can see my screen okay and hear me. Uh, I want to talk to you about um, various ways that we're gonna see changes, I think, uh, across Africa in uh, conservation of wildlife habitat. And so I'm going to um, first talk about the uh, relationship between existing climate. This is not climate change yet. I won't get to that till later, but current climate conditions with human livelihoods and then how livelihoods predispose us to certain kinds of conflicts with wildlife. And then the big question that I'm gonna devote most of my time on, which is the relationship between human population, both globally and continental wide within Africa and our need to feed ourselves, food demands, what impact that has on the land. So throughout all of this, everything is gonna come back to human population and human population growth in the coming century. So at the end, I'm gonna be looking forward to potential scenarios reaching out to the end of this century. And everything is gonna to depend to a large extent on what happens with our own population. So I wanna start out with some research we did a few years ago. Uh, across Northern Tanzania, where we started surveying uh, people living next to important conservation areas around the Serengeti, Ngorongoro, Tarangiri, Kilimanjaro, very famous, very important wildlife areas in Northern Tanzania near the Kenyan border. We surveyed livelihoods, we surveyed uh, socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera. The key thing I wanna focus on here is that in an area like this, you see a division that some communities primarily consist of farmers. So each dot here is a different village that we surveyed. And in many cases, about 40% of the population of that village were farmers and nobody was a pastoralist. So the primary livelihood was farming but then other communities were pastoralists rather than farming. So why is there this division between these two livelihoods? Well, it's clearly rainfall. Where it rains enough, and it's about 50 to 55 millimeters of rain per month, is enough rain for agriculture. Less than that, the land is too dry for crops, so people get their traditional livelihood through pastoralism, through livestock. Now this division between these two livelihoods drives a lot of important issues involving conflict with people. The first one I want to talk about is the most horrific form of conflict imaginable. And this is where lions actually attack people for food. These are man-eating lions. And we were asked to do this work about a dozen years ago uh, by the Tanzanian government because they're experiencing an unprecedented outbreak of attacks on people. We looked at where this is going on across the country. And so here's Tanzania, here's these famous wildlife areas up in the north. But the big worst man-eating area was in the coastal area down here near the Indian Ocean. And these are regions that are agricultural. There's sufficient rain for crops. And this is what makes people vulnerable to man-eating lions. What had happened has been that in those regions, this is now looking at the number of lion attacks in a Tanzanian district. And we had surveyed how much prey was left. So impala, wildebeest, buffalo, zebra, etc. And not surprising to anyone is that when prey were largely gone, so there are very few prey left in some of these districts because they'd been converted to agriculture, that's where the most attacks occurred. So this is where the lions had to turn to people as a source of sustenance. But there was one exception to this, and this was a species, the bush pig, and man-eating was worse in those districts that had the highest abundance of bush pigs. Why is that? Well, people are subsistence farmers. Bush pigs create a lot of damage. They'll eat people's crops at night. The only thing for the 
lions to eat in these districts with nothing else is bush pigs. So they would follow the bush pigs into the fields and find people who are protecting their crops in these very inadequate shelters against crop damage by the pigs. And so our mitigation effort there was to see if there were ways that we could reduce the amount of crop damage to these people's uh, livelihoods from the bush pigs. And you can see that in these control plots that we had, nearly half, if they didn't go out, if there was no protection, they would have lost the crop entirely to these nocturnal crop pests. We tried various irritants, that's like lights. You've heard about lion lights. Well, these were bush pig lights, uh, noisemakers. They didn't really work. What did work was a physical barrier. So if you build a simple fence around people's fields, or if there was a trench where the, the pigs couldn't cross, then it works, that protects their fields. And so barriers was the way forward. And in one of the villages we worked in, people had not been doing this traditionally, but seeing the impacts of having a barrier meant that they built their own fences and therefore were able to protect themselves better against bush pigs and then ultimately against lion attacks. Now let's go to the other area where it's pastureless, where it's dry. This is Northern Tanzania. This is Tarangiri Park. We have a national park here. Where one of my former students had put GPS collars on lions. And what happens in an area like this with these dry areas is that prey animals move around over large areas and the lions follow them. And so during certain times of the year, the lions are outside the national park most of the time where they come into contact with pastoralist villages and there's problems. So Bernard Kasui, who did this research, found that the lions were the primary predator on people's cattle, sometimes on goats and sheep, whereas hyenas and leopards, almost all of their predation was on goats and sheep. Now for the Maasai people, cattle are much more important culturally uh, animal than the goats or sheep. And so retaliatory killings were much more frequently directed towards lions than they were towards hyenas and leopards. Also lions are easier for them to catch and kill because they're much more, uh, lions are kind of uh, entitled, you know, after they've killed a cow or something, they might wander a little way off and then they'll growl at you from underneath the bush. And then, well, if you've got a spear, you can deal with it. Whereas the other two species tend to run and hide much further away. Well, the point of this is that where there were more livestock events, so this is in a village where these events took place, more lions were killed in retaliation. And it was almost one lion for every cow that was killed by lions. So this is not good odds for the future of lion conservation. Now, if we look at livestock depredation, lions do attack livestock during the daytime and how often they're successful in attacking livestock herds depends on a couple of things. One is how many herders are there per cow? And so if you have a very large herd with very few herders, so each individual is trying to look after 150 cows by himself, then the lions can more easily attack the herd. And so one way to deal with this, of course, is to have more herders per cow, right? Instead of one herder per 150 cows, if you had one third as many cows per herder, you would greatly reduce your risk. But another thing that became very apparent is that it's not always the warrior, the Morani, that goes out and looks after the cattle. Often this task is done by children. When you have a seven or eight year old boy out trying to herd the cows, well, the lions can tell the difference and they're much more likely to attack. So this would again suggest that there's a solution perhaps if you could get people to make sure that they send out only their best warriors. In other words, the highest quality herders could greatly reduce the conflict and therefore the need for retaliatory killing. But how do we know if whatever we're trying to do to conserve lions is actually successful? So we need to have an objective measurement of conservation success. And this is where there's an advantage to actually working with a species like lions, because it's pretty easy to, to say that if you're looking at lions in Namibia, there's not much prey out there. So you wouldn't expect to see very many lions. 
Whereas if you're working in the Serengeti or these East African areas with very high prey biomass, you'd expect to be able to see a lot of lions. And so in fact, uh, Sue Canny and uh, Andy Loveridge worked out some time ago with traditional uh, sort of old data in the past, how many lions there were as a function of how much prey biomass there were. So here you'd expect a lot of lions, here you'd expect a few. And if you see within a certain area, if you measure, if you measure the prey biomass or the expected prey biomass, you'd expect to see a certain number of lions. And if you're seeing more lions than that, then hey, you're doing a good job at conserving your lions. If it's below that, not so successful, okay? So we use this measure to estimate success of lion conservation across a number of different reserves in Africa. And so first I wanna talk about another mitigation strategy that is often employed to try to reduce the impacts of uh, lions on livestock. And this is very much involves a lot of very intensive efforts, working with communities, working with traditional uh, within traditional societies. And this has been funded by a number of different conservation agencies, Panthera, Wildcoat Oxford, the Big Cats Initiative, National Geographic, the Lion Recovery Fund, they're all pushing these and they're very successful as far as we can tell. Living with lions is one of these. So you actually work with the pastoralists, you have radio collars on your lions and let them do the tracking. And so then they have a stake in helping to protect their own herds against livestock predation by lions. And so there's one in Tanzania, one of my former students here, Indola Janssen is doing in Ngorongoro, Kope. But the granddaddy of all these is Lion Guardians. And this is near Amboseli in Kenya. This was the first one of this type where they spent a long time working with local communities, getting them to improve their husbandry practices so as to reduce the conflict ultimately because fewer lions killed means fewer, fewer livestock killed means fewer lions killed in response. And so in their study area, the Lion Guardian study area, we have a measure of how many lions there ought to be. That's the red line from that previous graph. And so there should have been about six or seven lions per hundred square kilometers in this region. And when they started the Lion Guardians project, it was only about one or less than one. It took a while for the program to work, but then it started going up, okay? And these data are, are fairly old now because they're too busy working with the guardians to keep track of how many lions, but for everything I've heard is the population has continued to recover. So these are very promising. But one of the things I just want to point out before I move on is that they often rely on incredible efforts, often by charismatic individuals to push all these programs forward. So the Lion Guardians project was started by Leela Haza. She's actually, her family is originally from Egypt. Uh, she did her degree in the US, but she's worked very closely. And she has a very talented group of people in around Amboseli to make sure that this continues going forward. I do have to ask though, you know, what happens going forward decade after decade? Will there continue to be this much effort to try to protect the, the, wild, the wild, to protect the livestock against the wild predators? Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but we don't yet know. And I think it's easier to imagine a project like this where the population was so low, very few lions, that you don't have that much conflict that it could be relatively simple to try to keep it in uh, in check. Okay, another one strategy that we know works using the same measure is simply putting a fence around it. And if we have a fence around a reserve, we can go back again to that regression line I showed comparing a Namibia with the Serengeti. And you have fenced reserves are always at or above their potential carrying capacity. Fenced reserves do an excellent job at conserving the lions. And then why not? Because the lions are not killing anybody's livestock. So they're not being poisoned in retaliation. A fence is also a good barrier to help protect prey populations against uh, bushmeat trade, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas unfenced areas are traditionally doing very, very poorly. And some of them are doing horrifically poorly. So there's only 10% as many lions as you might expect. That was true in the area around Amboseli where the lion guardians, when they started, it's typical of one of these. 
And what we see is if that we look at how much money is invested in trying to protect lion populations across different unfenced reserves. And so these are from all different parts of Africa, that the more money you put in, you can actually get pretty good protection uh, of your lion population, but it's really quite expensive. And the success you have in protecting your lions depends on the hum human population density around your reserve. So in a low human population density area, for a given budget, you can do a better job at protecting your lions than where it's high human population density. So clearly the more people, the more potential there is for conflict, the more retaliatory killings, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a challenge because it requires an awful lot of money to protect these unfenced reserves, a really lot of money to be able to do this, whereas fenced reserves can guarantee it. They're not that cheap, but in fact, you can get a pretty good result at a lower budget than you can for an unfenced reserve. Now, again, on this whole point, this is just how many lions were in the reserve when we did this analysis about 10 years ago, but we also had data on what was the population trend. And in these unfenced reserves, a lot of them were not only low, but they were still declining. And so we could estimate that of the places that we had data on, about half of them might lose their viability and essentially go extinct by about 2050. So the trajectory for these unfenced reserves is not good. It's not positive. Okay, so fences work, but wait a minute, where are you gonna put fences up? And I wanna use the Serengeti as a good example for the pluses and minuses of fencing. Now the Serengeti is obviously the most famous wildlife area just about in the whole world. And it's right next to Lake Victoria. You get seasonal rainfall, which comes off the, the Indian Ocean, but you also get some dry season rain that's caused by the moisture from the lake. Now, as you're very close to the lake, you see a lot of agriculture. So this is our division again, more rainfall, more agriculture. And so what's happened is that whereas much of this drier area over here has retained its savanna uh, ecosystem, this has all been lost to agriculture. And a lot of this is relatively new. In the last 15, 20 years, any available land out here has been chopped down and farmed. And so you have high rainfall and you have crops, okay? This is people's livelihoods. But here you have an additional problem besides just lions and that's the elephant. And so just in the last year or so, a fence has been going up around this side of the Serengeti. It is being fenced on the outside of these game reserves, not the park itself, but these game reserves, largely under pressure by local communities to protect their crops, their livelihoods against elephants that can cause such massive amount of damage in a short period of time. On the other hand, in these low rainfall areas, you have considerable movement of wildlife and livestock, depending on where it happened to rain. Rain is not evenly distributed. You might get a rainfall up here one week, and so everything moves up towards the green pastures, then it rains down here and everything moves back down. You can't put a fence around that because you'd be blocking wildlife migrations and access of people to pasture. So what do you do in these low rainfall areas? So first, I just want to say that We've looked now at the fencing problem on a continental scale. And we looked across all of Africa as to where the best solution would be a fence because here, like in Ethiopia, you've got a massive amount of human activity, high degree of agriculture, high human population density, and then you have a wildlife area. And so there should probably be a fence there, just like there is at the border of Nairobi National Park with the city of Nairobi, okay? Here's in Tanzania, here's the Western Serengeti, we said, so there's all farmland over here, the habitat's been lost, you've just got so much conflict. And a fence here would protect people from elephants and from lions, and at the same time then reduce the need for retaliatory actions against those wildlife by the local people. When you get down to Southern Africa, in a lot of these areas, there's such a low human population density you wouldn't consider fencing around Namibia or Botswana. And so 
it really depends on where the human activity level abuts the remaining wildlife habitat. Just one other graph of this. Again, with the Western Serengeti, not the Eastern, parts of Uganda, parts of Ethiopia, these are the sorts of areas where it's not yet common to see fencing, but it is growing. So there's fences that are going up around uh, Mount Kenya National Park in Kenya up here, and also parts of Savo, because there's just simply too many people, too much agriculture, it's a hard boundary. So just like South Africa has been doing for a long, long time, fences are likely to become much more common. We're gonna see fences in Benin, we're gonna see fences more and more in Uganda, et cetera, et cetera. That is one of the features of wildlife is it's gonna look more like South Africa as the human population, human activity intensifies across the rest of Africa. Okay, but again, in these areas that you cannot fence because it's, wild, it's too unpredictable, the animals need to move around over such big distances, what we see is the formation of a lot of conservancies. And I think some of the most interesting conservancies today are in Kenya, and they're right around Maasai Mara. So you have this greater Serengeti ecosystem. We have the wildebeest migration that's always gone between Kenya and Tanzania. There's one reserve here that's government run in Kenya, but now there are what were group ranches in Kenya that have now become conservancies. So this is the area I'm gonna focus on now. And so in these conservancies, and this is an early map, there are now 15 of these conservancies just around up here. Here's the government managed reserve. And there's an interesting contrast between what's happened in the last 20 years or so in the Mara Reserve itself, where there's been a lot of revenue that comes into tourism, but it's not necessarily gone back to local communities. It hasn't gone back to conservation. It's been lost. The polite word for that is revenue leakage. And that's a serious problem in the Mara, has been traditionally. Also, this has not been very effective at keeping livestock grazing out of the reserve itself. And so there's been overgrazing. There's concern now that the wildebeest migration is spending less time in Kenya and more time in Tanzania because of the overgrazing here on the Kenyan side. Not surprising then the wildlife numbers themselves were evidence was available that inside the reserve, wildlife numbers were going down. In contrast, there was one study in the Olari Motorogi Conservancy, one of these up here just outside the government area, that's quite a different story. This is a conservancy that is owned by a thousand different Maasai families. It's their land. They agreed to move somewhere else to make this land available for wildlife and to graze their livestock elsewhere for much of the time. And one study from about five or six years ago suggested that this area now has the highest lion density in Africa. This is an area that before was a conservancy had virtually no lions and now is known as being an area with the highest lion density in all of Africa. So this is a, a rescue of this area by the conservancy movement, okay? What seems to be key to this in engaging local communities is that they have, it's their land, they can make the decision, okay? And this resulted, again, it took time for people to get the trust of the community and to get people to work with them to form this conservancy. And it was a decision about their land. So they are conservationists now too, okay? And this brings to mind a very famous quote from the American conservationists from about a, a century ago, saying that conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who conserves the public interest. And the public interest is we would all like to see these wildlife areas protected, but it really depends on the private landowner, landowner sharing that responsibility and that concern. Okay. Well, that's all the good side of this, but there are problems in these conservancies too. So a lot of these conservancies, people said, yes, we'll move, but where are you gonna go? I mean, there's a lot of people in Kenya, where are you gonna go? Well, the people actually moved into this area right here between their conservancy and the reserve. What about the livestock? Well, a lot of those livestock, eh, they actually sneak in to the reserve at night. 
and graze illegally. So what has happened to some extent is that these conservancies have outsourced the pastures to the government land and then let the wildlife come to them so they can have the tourism up here. So it's a complex story and it's not necessarily the kind of um, silver bullet that we were all hoping to see. It's more complicated than we thought. And even more is the fact that yes, there are revenue now coming into these families. So they get a certain amount of rent paid for by the lodges, by the tour companies in exchange for that being used for wildlife and not exclusively by cattle. But if you ask people in those conservancies, hey, what are you gonna do with the money now you're getting from tourism? They'll say, hey, we'll buy more cattle. And so ultimately we have a problem. We have too many cows, more and more people, and where is everything gonna to fit together with the wildlife? This has come to a head again in the Serengeti ecosystem with one last area I wanna discuss here, and that's the Ngorongor Conservation Area. So this is a national park. People are not allowed to live or farm inside here. These game reserves, again, people are not allowed to live or farm, farm in there, in this game reserve here. Neither are they allowed to live or farm in the Mara. But in Ngorongoro, this was in 1959 set aside as the first multi-use land area in the world. It's essentially a national park, except Maasai were allowed to continue to live inside the conservancy, provided they only followed their traditional pastoralist lifestyle. What has happened since 1959 has been that the human population has grown exponentially. So there were only about five or 6,000 people in this big area when it was first gazetted. Now there's at least 80,000 people in the area, okay? So in the meantime, the livestock, if you look at tropical livestock units, so a cow is worth a cow, goats and sheep are like three or four sheep is equal to a cow. If you total those all up, the number of livestock was already pretty much at its limit. So the Maasai, those 5,000 Maasai were already grazing as many livestock as the area could hold back in the 1960s. And so through time, the livestock population in terms of livestock units hasn't grown. Whereas the human population has grown exponentially. What that means is per capita, the amount of meat on the hoof per person has gone way down, okay? And this horizontal red bar is really important because according to the World Health Organization, FAO and everybody, if you are going to live a successful pastless lifestyle, each person should have between three or four livestock units. And the people living in the Angorica Conservation Area fell below that number by about 1990. It's way below it now way below what people could possibly live on, on a pure pastus lifestyle. Now this has not been lost on the authorities. This is not a conservancy like up here. This is a government run conservation area where people were allowed to live, et cetera, et cetera. And so the government has decided earlier this year, just in the last month or two, that there are too many people in Ngorongoro they're gonna to have to relocate people, okay? The government of Tanzania says this is gonna be voluntary. The Maasai people don't agree that it's voluntary. A lot of them are gonna to have to move. And remember, we've got about 80,000 people in this area. And so the government now is in conflict with the Maasai in Ngorongoro, telling them not to, to make a fuss about being moved. This is a kind of conflict I think we're gonna see more and more of as human populations continue to grow throughout Africa. It's not just Tanzania, it's not just in Ngorongoro. Let's look now at population growth per se, because this is the main thing I want to deal with in this conversation today. Human population growth has followed a very interesting pattern around the world. Most of Europe, Russia, China, Australia, Canada, these countries, the average number of children per woman fell below 
2.1, that's replacement, before the year 2000. The US has fallen below that in the last few years. Other countries throughout the world have already fallen below replacement or are expected to in the next few years. But look at Africa. There's no country in Africa that's come close to that. And most of these, like Tanzania, again, may not fall below replacement for another 50 years. So that means we'd expect to see really rapid population growth continuing throughout Africa for quite some time. And the implications for this are utterly profound. If we look at the amount of food it's gonna to take to feed people in each part of the world because population growth has leveled off or fallen below replacement in Asia, Latin America, also in Europe, then the increased amount of food production that will be required to keep everybody healthy in the next 40, 50 years is very small. In contrast, Africa's demands for food is going to, is expected to increase exponentially, okay? So if we think about what that means in terms of wildlife, there are a number of endangered species, of course, in each African country. My colleagues and I have looked at this and estimated that if human population grows, if food consumption grows as predicted on that earlier slide, then the extinction threat risk is so high throughout most of Africa, the middle part of Africa especially, that we will see massive loss of wildlife habitat there's not enough land in Tanzania to feed its entire population. There's not enough land in all of Zambia to feed its population. Mozambique, Congo, Angola, etc. Okay, not even, it's just, it's impossible if things continue as they have done. Now, this is based on the assumption that everything will continue going forward as it has done for the last 40 or 50 years. And so this graph, this map, is based on the assumption that farming continues to be small scale, relatively inefficient. If you look at the yields, the crop yields in African farming is remarkably low compared to what's possible in other parts of the world. We may not like industrial agriculture, but it feeds an awful lot of people from a relatively small amount of land. That means less land has to be converted to farmland from native habitat. If just by improving yields in Africa to what they are in the European and American nations, you could essentially get rid of the extinction risks by 2060. Instead of almost everything going extinct in these countries, these can almost vanish, provided that yield gaps, the poor yields from traditional farming techniques are replaced by more modern high yield activities, okay? Okay. So we have to feed the world. The world population is growing. What can we do to minimize future loss of wildlife habitat? And this is something I've been working on with my colleagues for the last year and a half. This is how I spent COVID, is thinking about these questions of what can be done on a global scale to maximize the chances for biodiversity in the coming century. And so one of the first things that we want to consider is, okay, farming is going to increase but can we say where you're gonna to have to do more farming so as to reduce impacts on biodiversity? So if the agricultural estate must expand in response to a growing human population, where would habitat loss have the least impact on biodiversity? If you're gonna farm new areas, where should you go? And so first I just want to familiarize you with this idea that we're gonna look at countries uh, who have different socioeconomic status. And I'll explain that in a minute. But first, I just want you to keep in mind that some areas are really highly suitable for agriculture. They're flat, there's good soil fertility, there's access to water. And in many parts of the world, only about half of the best potential farmland is currently being formed, farmed. Of course, there's a lot of other areas that are not suitable at all. It's rocky, it's desert, you can't farm it. And of course, not much is being farmed there, okay? So we are seeing that globally, 
uh, most farming in most countries of the world is primarily in the most suitable places, okay? But biodiversity also varies in these areas, okay? So these also tend to be some of the most biodiverse areas, particularly in low-income countries. So now I can show you what these colors mean. So blue is India. So India is already farming most of its potential farmland. Not all, but most. So is China. Those are very crowded, densely populated countries. So it's not surprising they're doing, they're farming so much of their potential farmland. The richest countries, so this is the US uh, and, uh, and Europe and Australian places, we're actually farming about 40% of our best possible areas, okay? The poorest nations are in black here. And again, only about 20% of their best potential farmland is being farmed. Okay, so if more land is gonna have to be farmed because the population is growing, these graphs show how much biodiversity. So this is a number of different mammalian species in each suitability class. So again, look at high, this is the best place for farming. And on average, in the lowest country, the poorest countries, there is about 95 different mammalian species. But there are a few that have a lot more than that. And there's also a few that have a lot fewer than that. Okay, so there happen to be some areas in the poorest countries where agriculture is most likely to have to expand. And they have very low biodiversity. And that's true in a lot of the other economic status countries in the US, in Europe, in China, even in India. And so if new areas have to be converted to agriculture, if there was sensible planning, if people did this right, you could try to direct further expansion of farmland into the low biodiversity areas, the most suitable for farming and the lowest biodiversity. So that's those points. That's one possibility. Okay, the second is, well, let's look at supply and demand because supply and demand is what's driving this overall problem, okay? So supply has to grow to meet growing demand. Demand for food is equal to the population times per capita consumption, okay? And so this is looking at what has happened in all the nations of the world since 1960 up to 2018. What we've seen here, let us let me start with, uh, so this is population on the left and per capita consumption in the middle here. And so the population growth is the most rapid compared to 1961. So this is all a ratio of what's the population today compared to what it was in 1961. Population growth has been most rapid in the poorest nations. It's been the lowest in the richest nations, okay? So there's still more people in these rich late nations than there are in the poor nations, but our population in the US and elsewhere has been relatively low compared to rapid increase in the poorer nations. On the other hand, demand has gone up in the richer nations a lot because our demand is going up. I mean, our, our per consumption, our per capita consumption. So each individual in, in, the, in the richer countries consumes the equivalent of about 10,000 calories per day. Now you only need about 2,500 for a healthy diet. So consumption of food crops is huge in the rich countries. And again, if we look at a ratio, what we see is it's been increasing in the richer countries and the poor nations, their per capita uh, increase has not, has not happened. The per capita intake of food in the poorest nations is about the same today as it was in 1961, okay? So we've got two different drivers here, population in the poorer nations and per capita consumption in the richer nations. So what about supply? So that's equal to the land cultivated times the yield. If we look at cropland area, what we see is again with this ratio, the poorer nations are meeting their population growth food demand by farming more land, okay? The richer nations have actually kind of ceased growing. We don't have that, we, don't, we have no more land in agriculture in the US today than we did 60 years ago. We've stopped expanding the number of farms in our country. Instead, what we've been able to do is increase the yields 
on the land that we have. So we have much higher yields, okay? So the poor nations are expanding, the richer nations have improving their yields. And look again that the poor nations have not been able to improve their yields. So that's why they have to increase the amount of land, okay? So these are the four different drivers of supply and demand. What's gonna dictate how much land is left for, line, for wildlife habitat in the coming years, okay? So what do we do? And I want now to really turn our eyes towards hope <laughs> because this is something that every country world has signed on to. It's called the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. And the aim is to have a more just and a more equitable world. And it has a number of goals that if these were sustained would have a profound impact on those supply and demand curves that I just showed you going forward to the rest of the century. If we can eradicate poverty, eradicate hunger, improve health and well-being, provide quality education and gender equality, particularly in the poorest nations, the implications are huge, absolutely huge. And one, one way of looking at this is, this is just one aspect of all those different components, but this is average family size as a function of education. So this is a number of years of education that a woman receives in her lifetime. And in countries where the average education goes through college, then the number of children born per female that reaches 50 years of age, so her reproductive life, goes below replacement, okay? In countries or situations or times when education level is very low, women have a lot more children, okay? This is feeding the human population bomb, as it were. This is how to stop it. By improving education for women, providing all kinds of other things that we know affect fertility, female fertility in human populations. And so if we have fertility rate globally here, uh, that there are different scenarios depending on whether education and poverty reduction are met according to those sustainable development goals, then the fertility rate, which is currently at a global scale, a little bit above replacement, wouldn't go below it at a global scale. But if we can get these development goals met, if the world really does help the poorer nations to get out of poverty, et cetera, et cetera, then this would actually happen fairly soon to reach replacement. And this now is just looking at Africa. And so in the absence of this, we expect the human population to keep growing, but with the SDGs implemented, again, it would come down below replacement within the next 15 years or so. An amazing transformation could occur. And the consequence of this on global population couldn't be greater. So as if nothing really happens, the human population on a global scale is headed towards 14 billion people by the end of the century. But if the sustainable development goals could be met, population would actually peak by around 2050 and then come down, okay? Now think about that. If the human population came down, we don't need to feed as many people. And so the amount of land that would be lost to agriculture, maybe some of that could even be returned back to nature, okay? Now, rapid economic development is possible. This has been seen in Asia. These are known as the Asian tigers, Cambodia, Vietnam, et cetera. Cambodia, uh, sorry, Vietnam in 1960 looked a lot like Africa. Poverty levels were high, maternal mortality. This is before the war. And despite having a horrific war and being bombed almost out of existence by the US and its allies for many years, Vietnam today is far better developed. Their fertility is far lower. It's a thriving, you know, just as, as it's doing really, really well economically. So it is possible to have rapid economic development. Now, one of the things we have to be concerned about with uh, this going forward is the fact that we can try, as that earlier slide suggested, if we could reduce yield gaps in Africa, we would reduce the amount of land that needed to be converted to, wild, to uh, cropland. But one of the things that we've seen is that as yields go up, so this is the amount of food being produced per hectare of land, 
So does consumption. So does consumption. And this is true everywhere except the poorest countries. They haven't done this. So their yields haven't increased much, but their per capita consumption hasn't gone up either. Okay. So that was sort of seen in some of those earlier graphs. But this really emphasizes that as countries get richer, they tend to have better production, higher yields, but then they tend to consume more. And so what's happening in a lot of these cases is, hey, we all like beef, let's have grain fed beef. So now instead of having cropland being producing crops for feeding people, it's feeding cows. And this of course has huge problems. So obesity is a massive problem in the richer countries as people are consuming too much. And also we're producing ethanol. So this is food that could feed people but is instead being converted to ethanol to feed cars. So our richer nations, to a large extent, have been taking advantage of more food per, per hectare to feed things that aren't people. It's not going to the essentials of human life. On the other hand, there are some trends that could be very positive here. There are things called impossible burgers. There's uh, Burger King, a big uh, fast food chain now sells Impossible Burgers. This is made from plants. KFC, I don't know if they have these in, in Southern Africa yet because you have KFC all over the place. There's now plant-based chicken. So instead of feeding your cow a lot of corn to get a small amount of beef, you take just a small amount of corn to make a burger, okay? You can also have oat milk instead of dairy. And hey, if we could move over to electric cars and away from fossil fuels and ethanol, then that would greatly reduce the consumption. So our per capita consumption would come down. Okay, so going forward, we can assume that maybe yields will continue to grow. If we look over the last half century, surprisingly, these yield growths, as I showed earlier, uh, have been quite surprisingly linear. And one estimate is that, well, There'll be, new, uh, there'll be new breakthroughs in farming that you can get even higher yields and you could potentially get up to even twice as high to what they are today, okay? So historic data suggests that going forward, crop yields could eventually double, but there's a big unknown here. There's a lot of people who are concerned that crop yields may not double after all because of climate change more erratic rainfall, higher temperatures. So we don't know for sure what's gonna happen with crop yields. Okay, the one last factor I wanna put into this is that all of our food has to be put into a global perspective because there are parts of the world that are incredibly productive. And that's not just that they've got technology, they've got the right climate, they've got the right soils. These are able to produce food at an incredible rate massive amount of food that can then be exported. Far more food than they could possibly eat goes elsewhere. And a lot of countries in the world already do rely on imports. But there could be even more food that could be exported from the richer countries or the more productive countries to the less that would prevent the need for transforming the land in the poor yield countries. Okay, so I've gone through all of this as a background to show you this very complicated graph. And that, this is, we're getting to my final take home message here. But I want everybody to just think about how this could all work together going forward. Now, if we consider business as usual, and this is just allowing past 50 years patterns of how yields have increased through time, how uh, population growth has increased through time, how exports have gone, et cetera, et cetera. And you put all these here, that what we expect, oops, what we expect to see is the need for a lot more land by 2050 to be added to the world's agricultural estate. And by 2100, a massive amount, particularly in the lowest, the poorest countries, okay? And then these orange are the next lowest ones. So it's the poorer countries that are gonna to have to add. On the other hand, because yields are increasing and because our populations in the West are declining, 
then we might be able to release some of our land from agriculture, okay? So we could have less land going into agriculture than we did before, okay? Now, if we were to expand trade, even with business as usual, there should be enough food made in these higher production areas to eliminate the need to expand agriculture in the poorest nations. These needs in the poor nations could be met by the land being released from agriculture in the richer countries, okay? If we have economic development where we actually increase women's education, all those things that are in the sustainable development goals, this has quite remarkable effects because we would then expect that as these countries are richer, they'd be able to accelerate the closing of their yield gaps. So the amount of land that they need would not be as great going forward over what they already have. We can liberate yet more land ourselves, okay? And we could actually, if we were to trade, we could really reduce the total amount of farmland needed to meet all of our needs by 2050 and 2100, okay? If we do the same thing with limiting our consumption in the West, so we're not developing, we're not doing any good things for the poor nations, we're just, cutting down on beef and ethanol ourselves, cutting our own consumption in half, then that would liberate a lot more of our land. Okay? It wouldn't do anything for the poor nations, but it'd make our land uh, available for food for people rather than cows and cars. <laughs> and so again, the amount of land could go down. And if we added these together, so the rich does their part to reduce their consumption, and they also help in the economic development of the poor nations, you could greatly reduce the amount of land needed, okay? Now this is all, this scenario is based on yields increasing as we've seen over the last 50 years. If we assume on the other hand, that there's no further yield increases because climate change is gonna mech everything up so badly, then it gets really scary, okay? So nothing is as happy as it was over here, okay? Except that if we again did all we could to develop the poor nations and reduce our own consumption, we might be able to, um, to make things less horrible by the end of the century, even if climate change blocks further increases in yields. Okay, that was really complicated. I hope this is a little less complicated. This is now looking at the net change, the amount of land. Currently, there's 1.5 billion hectares of land. This is American billion, so 1,500 million hectares are currently being used. If we have the worst case scenario of yield, yields not increasing because of climate change, the amount of land that we're gonna need by 2100 will be more than double what's being farmed today. That is truly the nightmare scenario. That would mean we'd literally have to start farming the moon, be able to feed ourselves, okay? If we had even in the absence of improved yields, if we could do our part to develop the poorer nations, things are going to get a lot worse, but at least they kind of stabilize because between 2050 and 2100, that's when human population would really decline. Okay, so at least it would level off by 2050. But if yields can increase, continue, and if we had development, then this is what we could see. So instead of having... 1,500 million hectares of farmland, we could use a lot less of that by 2100, okay? And that is just by doing our bit to help the poorest nations to go through the economic development and its associated demographic transition to smaller families, smaller land needs, okay? And again, if we could do the equitable things, we not only help the poorest nations, but we also limit our own consumption, that's LC, that's this one down here, we could greatly reduce it, okay? So the future could still be bright compared to the amount of land that we currently need to feed the world population could decline dramatically between now and the end of the century if we do the right thing, okay? So the future might not be so bad for wildlife if the world works together to achieve the sustainable development goals for all of Africa, Yields would rise with economic development, population growth would be slowed and eventually reversed, even in Africa. The richest nations should also lower their per capita consumption 
food for people, not cows and cars. Yields continue to grow despite climate change. And it may not be as bad as we think from climate change because there are new developments coming in all the time. Technology could actually help us even with climate change. And highly productive countries continue to export more crops and do even more to export excess crops to the less productive countries, okay? So the future might not be so bad if the world really is full of unicorns and rainbows. How many of these things are actually feasible? I don't know. I doubt any one of them are fully possible by the end of the century, but these are the things I think that we should be thinking about and trying to advocate our own governments to participate. Meanwhile, hey, reality check, guess what? There's a war going on right now in Europe where Russia has invaded Ukraine with disastrous consequences in the short term. That's ended grain exports. One of the best one of the best bread baskets in the world was the Ukraine and their exports have now been blocked because of the war. And that's gonna to lead to famine in many parts of the world. So we have a huge problem because of dependency on exports that could happen with political instability. And we're seeing it right now. The other is American government, the European governments are all saying we can't rely so much on Russian fuel because they're the bad guys here. How are we gonna make up the shortfall? in fossil fuel from Russia, hey, let's divert more of our crops to ethanol. So let's do more for biofuels. Now this latter one may just be a short-term problem because Europe and North America is trying to move away from fossil fuels anyway. This may just be a delay, but these are the kinds of problems that we have to recognize can happen with political instability. Two, on that unhappy note, or happy, depending on your point of view. That's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you. Ian had his hand up first. Um, Ian, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. And then as soon as we're done with um, uh, the uh, hands being raised, I'll go through some of the questions on the uh, chat. Um, thanks. Ian? <laughs> Thank you, and thank you, Craig, for cheering us up on a, <laughs> an evening in England. Um, I'm a big fan of unicorns and rainbows, but what I wanted to ask you specifically when you were talking about the um, increased number of cattle per pastoralist, um, have you spoken to Finn Davy in Kenya, who's trying to get a virtual livestock unit concept off the ground where um, herders might have wealth by rep virtual representation of livestock, which would have less of an impact on the, the land, but still enable them to, to use the cattle for a lot of the cultural things that they keep them for, not for food, but just for um, wedding gifts or, or you know, those sorts of things. I have not heard of that. That sounds like an excellent idea. Could you send me a, a, a link to that? I'll put you and Finn in touch with each other, yeah. Okay, great. Super, no, I really appreciate that. Because um, one of the things that people have been trying to do in the Mara, uh, I don't know if my Kenyan counterparts are still here, but um, they've been telling me that um, it's, it, again, the situation in Masai Mara is quite complicated. Uh, there has been uh, an interest in um, replacing some of the traditional uh, livestock breeds with the faster growing breed from Laikipia up in Northern Kenya, up at the um, uh, NRT. And uh, the idea is to try to get the Maasai over to the, to the uh, cash economy. And so then you value qu quality of your livestock rather than quantity. Uh, but what's been happening is that a family will say, oh yeah, we want both. So it's great having these really high, high yield cows. We get money off of that, but then we, we still get the cultural value from having our other herds. So they now have two herds of livestock instead of one. But if you could have some substitute for that cultural thing, that would be fantastic. I'd really like to learn more about that, please. I'll send you Finn's um, concept. And uh, I, I haven't given a very good summary of it, but you, you get the idea perhaps. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, uh, Ian. Um, uh, Peter Mulls, um, I'm gonna ask you to Peter Mills has just disappeared off my screen. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to now ask questions off the, uh, off the chat. 
Um, yes, and I, I've, yes. Unmuted, I've unmuted Peter Mills. Oh, okay, cool. Peter Hi. Mills. Hi, um, thanks, Craig. Uh, great talk. Um, I've got two comments and then two questions. The first one is, I, I don't think there is a, a silver bullet that we're all looking for. And associated with that, not all green technologies are that green. They've all got a negative aspect to them. And I think we've got to keep that in mind. Um, at, at one point during your talk, you mentioned uh, leakage um, and, and leakage of money and leakage of resources. And I think that is a common problem with conservation projects. The, the money isn't going to the right places and it gets siphoned off um, to, I think it's called elite capture, where, where various role players take the money away from where it should be going and it should be going to the community. So those are my two comments. The two questions are, um, in South Africa, we have lots of fences and um, that affects the ecological or genetic pathways of species, especially megafauna like, like lions and, and elephants. And I'd just like your comment on that. And then I'd also like your comment on, well, I just want you to, um, what is the legal position of the conservancies in, in Kenya? Because um, all these things fall within some kind of a, a framework, a, a legal framework. And I just want to understand the, the legal framework of the conservancies in Kenya a little bit better. Thank you. Um, let me start with that last question because I'm, I'm not fully sure, but my understanding is that those conservancies do have, uh, they are legally recognized, they do have uh, some sort of legislative support. So I, I think they are secure. Um, so I think that that's, that's okay there. Um, the uh, illegal capture one, uh, what I want to say about illegal capture is that if you look at uh, and now we'll go ahead and use the C word, which is corruption. If you look at uh, corruption rankings versus poverty, they're pretty strongly correlated. And so um, the fact is that when in a country, when people are so poor that they generally don't pay taxes, then they tend not to pay as much attention to what the government's doing. The government doesn't care that much about what the public thinks. And so um, in my own country of the US, if we look at corruption back in the 1840s and 50s, it was pretty horrific. I mean, back in New York City in the 1840s, the police set the fires and you paid them to put out the fires that they set. <laughs> now, we have our problems with corruption today, but we largely got over that, I would say, through the development of a strong middle class, which comes from economic development. So I think one can it doesn't always go that quickly and corruption is very hard to weed out once it happens. But um, again, economic development, I would suggest would be our best hope for trying ultimately to deal with the corruption problem. And then your first comment uh, was about uh, the, the uh, side effects of green technology. Uh, and obviously that has to be considered very, very carefully because one of, the, one of the reasons we did this on land with the team of people I was working with on this project for that last part of my talk is that um, agriculture is one of the primary sources of greenhouse gases. And so conversion of land uh, from nat native habitat to agriculture is really horrific on our carbon footprint. And so anything we can do to that has, will, will have its own good impacts and so uh, any other technological fix that comes forward, I think people are, are far more mindful about potential uh, unintended consequences, particularly in terms of carbon emission than has been, um, has been the case in the past. And I mean, even, even the intensification of uh, agriculture, uh, there's now some good data coming in uh, from uh, countries like um, China that are doing a lot through simple things like crop rotation and like mixed crops. So you have legumes in with other kinds of plants, so you don't have to apply as much fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera. So some of those consequences are being reduced. Uh, 
And finally, with your question about the, uh, the meta population problems with these small fenced reserves, indeed, it's a problem. And so there is the African, um, there's, what is it? The African Lion Working Group works on this and the, um, uh, there's a, a lot of the small reserves in South Africa have a meta population program where they actually do translocate uh, at least the carnivores around from one reserve to the other. And we've done, actually I was involved with one of these where there's a genetic rescue in Shishlui and Falozi Park by bringing in some fresh blood from a different part of uh, South Africa and it worked great, but you have to do it regularly. You, you can't just do it once. It has to be part of the management of those, those areas. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, Andy Clee, you've got your hand up. Um, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Cool. Thank you very much, Craig. So my mind nearly went blank after that last comment, just the sort of prospect of, of the management of genetic biodiversity by humans until we get into more. Anyway, that wasn't the question. Food waste. Um, we currently waste, I think, about a third of the food produced globally. Did you consider that in your analysis? The rest of it was fantastic, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, actually, that's been a, in our last analysis. We, we our group, because I'm working with a number of economists on this, and food waste is really hard. Um, there was a, an interesting attempt in the UK about five or six years ago or I believe it was Sainsbury's, one of these big uh, you know, supermarket chains. And they were trying to get their customers to reduce food waste. And so they had a competition between different you know, supermarkets and different small sized towns across the country. <laughs> and um, they said, you know, we're gonna give you this big cash prize. You'll be famous across the UK as the, as the town that reduced your food waste, okay? And it didn't work didn't work. And so the people I've been talking to about this, yeah, we all think of it, yeah, because it's like 30%. And every time I look at the leftovers on my plate, I put them in the fridge, I'm not going to be part of that 30%. But you know, yeah, but it's really, really hard. And I think as far as food waste goes in Africa, again, it comes back to economic development, because a lot of the wastage in Africa is because the crop spoils before it gets to market. So it's a lack of infrastructure. So I think some of that can be dealt with, again, with economic development. We did not explicitly put that into our, our accounting because it's, it's, as I said, it's one of those things that seems pretty intractable. But at least, you know, subjectively, I think, again, economic development would help a lot with that, just reducing spoilage. I mean, the amount of crops that just gets eaten by birds waiting, you know, until the next, it's, it's really, it's frustrating. Great. Thanks very much, Craig. Anthony Walton, you've got your hand up. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, Anthony. Hi, hi, Alistair. Thank you. Um, yes, um, uh, Craig, you have a very uh, interesting talk. Thank you uh, very much. It's very insightful and, uh, and comprehensive. Um, and like others have said, yeah, you, you need to sort of uh, ruminate on it and take into account many things. I wanted to ask your 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 take on what you think the the security situation, especially in Africa, what um, how that stands to affect everything you you laid out for us. Because I mean, whether we talk about um, the turmoil in Mali and Western Sahara, yeah. Yeah. or um, Al Shabaab in East Africa, and uh, the recent insurgency in Mozambique starting to even come closer here to South Africa. You know, there's conflicts all over and that stands, um, as I see it, it, it stands to not only um, rob huge uh, uh, swathes of territories and many communities of the means to increase, as you say, their yields. It not only stands to do that, but it also stands to stop in its track the implementation of those um, Millennium Development Goals that you were talking of. So I wanted to just find out your your take. What do you think uh, is going to be the future of taking that into account? Yeah, I was trying not to be too depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, 
there was an exchange recently about um, <clears throat> comparing um, like the, imp so there was an, an exchange between uh, Peter Lindsay from the Lion Recovery Fund, uh, who on the one hand was talking about the huge impacts of uh, COVID on uh, wildlife conservation effort because of the loss of tourism. But then there was a, a, a kind of a, a response that came from uh, Hans Bauer and uh, a few other people who are saying, you guys are thinking about East and Southern Africa. You're not thinking about West Africa and it's, it's conflict. That's enormous. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's huge. And, you know, I don't, I haven't specifically looked at this, but I can only think that with economic development, I mean, everybody's so horrified in Europe at what Russia has done, you know, and um, we literally do have civil societies that run things in most of the developed nations. It's very unusual to have a thing like Russia invading Ukraine. And in Africa, it's not that one country is trying to conquer another, there are more civil conflicts. But I can't help but think that with economic development, again, if you can somehow get past some threshold that you know, these, these terrorist groups would have far less traction in those societies because, you know, I mean, it's kind of like what I think about what happened in South Africa at the end of apartheid. A lot of people were really frightened that the whole country was going to go up in flames at one point, and it didn't. In my understanding of the most important aspect of what maintained stability there was there was a middle class. And so there's sufficient economic development. I said, wait a minute, we don't want to we don't want everything to go to hell. And so I think when you've got such desperate situations in so many African countries like Somalia, like, like even Rwanda pre Kagame, um, you know, that's just like, well, what have we got to lose kind of thing. But uh, so I, I, that's, that's, that's only thing I can think of. Otherwise, yeah, we're, we're fucked. I'm sorry, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. Um, Anna, I see your hand. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to unmute now. Um, but I do want to add, I read an article on the way back uh, from Kruger earlier today stating that um, this uh, conflict that we're seeing between Ukraine and Russia is, is, uh, could essentially be the end of uh, international trade. Um, breaking breaking it down, which then creates a completely different conundrum to the scenarios that you presented, Craig. I think, um, Iowa, I think Iowa will still be available to export food. Iowa is our breadbasket in the US. I always use Iowa. As, that's our Ukraine. <laughs> and I, I think there will always be uh, interest in the US and Canada, uh, Argentina, uh, I don't think those countries, it, it, the breakdown in global trade involving Russia is going to be between Russia and China and their, their things with everybody else, I hope. Uh, but I can't imagine that's going to lead to us not doing it either. But it is, it's still, it just raises that prospect that we do rely on trade. We could do so much more if trade was better. So we certainly, we certainly need peace, love, dove, kumbaya. Cool. Thanks very much, Craig. <laughs> Anna, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Thank, thank you very much. And thanks, Craig. Yeah, fantastic presentation. Um, I'll try to be brief. Just uh, your focus on, on economic development is, is great. And I totally understand the benefits of economic development. I'm just wondering, kind of economic development in terms of measured by GDP in the past has actually led to huge environmental and ecological destruction. And so how do you kind of weigh that um, wanting that economic development, but using the correct metrics so that we don't have kind of develop um, or low income countries that we want to push through to economic development, going through that same phase of um, ecological destruction if we use incorrect metric systems, for example, GDP, which I think is, is flawed, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. so, yeah, just wondering if you have any thoughts on kind of a, a new economy type metric system yeah. to, to look at economic development. Thanks. So, yeah, that's, that's a great point. GDP is horrible metric. And so uh, the lead author on that last analysis I was showing is a, a, an environmental economist named Steve Pulaski, and he's on our faculty and also on the uh, natural, uh, what is it called? Uh, whatever, the sustainable program at Stanford. And uh, 
he's actually helped develop the GEP, which is the uh, gross ecological product. And that is actually being adopted by China. Um, so, I mean, he has tremendous influence with some of these policymakers. And so uh, when we talk about economic development, that's really a shorthand for basically you know, getting those, it's the SDGs. We, we're talking about those and those SDGs, they're not ultimately focusing on, on the uh, GDP. They're talking about household income. They're talking about you know, all of those things, education, equality, et cetera, et cetera. And they also have within them certain, uh, you know, I only emphasize the economic side, uh, but they also have things to do with the environment as well. But absolutely, anything that is just focusing on GDP like the Wall Street Journal would do, no. It's, it's got to be true, you know, ground level well-being of people and their education. Thanks, Anna. Um, I see that there's also a comment saying, I know Steve Polanski and NatCap, Natural Capital Project. Great group. We need, uh, we do need new metric systems like GEP. Um, then there was another comment here from, um, from, from Brigid saying, uh, surely global trade uses a huge amount of, uh, of fuel, shouldn't we promote and train in locally grown also um, um, mitigates food waste? Yeah. So uh, the fuel problem is certainly an issue. And uh, so I was trying to present the main take home messages from this uh, paper that we've written, that we've currently got out for review. And we certainly mentioned that. I mean, one of the things one can imagine for fuel going forward is solar because I mean, they've got a lot of surface. And um, so uh, there's always gonna be, I mean, there will probably always have to be some sort of biofuel. Maybe it'll come from, you know, genetically engineered bacteria or algae or something, um, or it'll have to be a certain amount of, of fossil fuel. But if you, if you take into account the consumption of fuel and transporting massive amount of food like that, as opposed to all, I mean, there's an economy of scale. And so, you know, some of the people in the US that uh, have been looking at like Grow Local, Grow Local doesn't always have the net best net benefit because we have 17 different tractors, each with their little plots. You had to manufacture those 17 tractors. You had to have the fuel and the maintenance and all of them versus one huge monstrous tractor that can cover all that. Like those huge things I was showing before by the way, those big combine harvesters I was showing, those were in Ukraine. So, I mean, they're, they're just incredibly efficient. So economy of scale and all of these things can come through. As far as the local farmers concerned, we are very worried about local farmers. And this is why. So if you look at the proportion of the American population that survives their livelihoods depend on directly on growing crops, it's like 2%. It's nobody. I mean, we've, we've all got these huge factory farms now. You have very few small time farmers in our huge population. You go to a country like Tanzania or Kenya and the majority of the population are subsistence farmers. So if you then have imports to, uh, to these countries where your population is primarily occupied by farming, that's gonna be very, very disruptive. So our primary worry about the exports is how do you deal with that kind of economic dislocation? And again, it comes back to economic opportunities in the poor nations. People farm because there's no other choice. If people are educated, would they still be subsistence farmers? Probably not. They'd probably go where there's an office and they have a job somewhere. So you have to be thinking about, and, and well, I don't know what the answers are. I'm just, one has to consider how all these things are interact. And I think the biggest disruption of full trade would be on, on the jobs in, in, the, in the recipient countries. Right. Um, okay, so there's no hands up currently in the room. You guys are more than welcome to. Hello, Marty. Uh, okay, You're, it's hiding behind a lion. Um, Marty, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> 
How's it? Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Craig, for the very interesting talk. And again, some mental gymnastics required to try and uh, keep up and understand all those graphs. But uh, I mean, you actually just discussed the point that I was going to make. Um, where the poorer countries are completely reliant on developed nations for the, the food actually creates that dependency, which is part of the problem. Um, that actually the, the, com the country within itself needs to have economic and value to be able to buy that food. And if they don't, then it's just a handing out situation which doesn't actually help anybody. So I, I think that's you know part of the problem. And then I think the whole cultural uh, mindset, it's easy for some nations to say don't have more children, but in terms of a cultural mindset, and it's it's not to say that it's wrong. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's such a difficult thing. And I don't know whether there's an easier solution. I mean, um, often people say education and that sort of thing, but I don't know whether it's only education. I mean, there's a lot of educated people who still have a cultural belief in terms of a um, a, a large family and, and many children and calculating wealth through that. So I think that's, I, I don't know if there's a, a, a cleverer way or a better way that we can try and turn some of those things around. So I think the, 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 the focus on the sustainable development goals is it would achieve. I mean, that, that graph I showed was from an analysis published in the Lancet last year where a bunch of demographers actually said, okay, if you did this with the known impacts of education, the known impacts on maternal mortality, and the known impacts for women's employment opportunities. This, this is what we see. And that was their, their best estimate of putting all those factors together. Uh, you're touching on another point that is cultural variation. And so one of the things that's often striking is, you know, we, we've, we've often thought of, you know, Catholic nations and having these huge Catholic families, you know, but they went through the demographic transition too. And everything tends to go down to that same general number on average. There'll still be a few families that have more kids than that and some that will have no children at all. But on average, the trends have been surprisingly similar. In Iran, uh, in the Arab countries where you'll have a lot of, uh, again, cultural things about having large families and all this, whoosh, did the same thing. And so there's a reason to suspect that they'll all converge on that common pattern, given those positive effects on well-being and opportunities. Uh, but there are some data from Africa that suggests that e even educated women um, would like to have larger families than they do. And so actually a colleague of mine at Oxford who's been looking at this has pointed out that in fact, you look at college-educated college African women, I forget which country this is in, but the preferred family, they still wanted a bigger family, but they weren't having it. They weren't having it. And, and part of the thing is, you know, kids are expensive. You have to pay for their schools. You have to, all of these things happen, no matter what your culture may be telling you. No, 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 I don't know if I can, I don't know if this is the right time, you know? So it may be that it won't be, that it won't follow exactly the same pattern in, uh, in Africa as it has elsewhere, but it might. And, and the other thing, you're right, there are other things that do come in. One is access to contraception. And some of the more positive things that have happened uh, is uh, in several East African countries, the, the average, popular, uh, average family size has actually decreased more than you would have predicted on educated. Because now, hey, women want contraceptions and, they, and they'll actually, they're gonna do it anyway, even if, if they're not educated yet. So there are things that are flipping I think one of the things that we, we don't yet fully understand are how are things like cell phones, internet, you know, I mean, people see how people behave in other places and they, you know, especially young people. I don't know if you've had kids or if you teach undergraduates. <laughs> my kids are now in their 30s, but my undergraduates are like, oh my God, they're impossible. <laughs> but, but, you know, they do their own thing, you know, and it's not just in, in the West. Young people are, they're kind of, there's a lot of things happening right now that may actually conspire to overcome some of those cultural things. Maybe I don't know. I mean, the, the Chinese model of the one one child family and all those sorts of things um, was frowned upon in the rest of the world, but you yeah. know, it did it did have some effects. 
But yeah. in, the, in, the, in the same breath, I think they are now trying to encourage because they've seen their numbers dropping and they've got a, a, a problem in terms of the future. Yeah. Um, so so there's, a, there's a kind of very fine balance of getting it right. <laughs> and, and you kind of need to get it right everywhere. And I think that's the problem. Um, yeah. Each place, in a way, needs to be sustainable in its own way. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's right. And I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, like the US population, um, you know, if it was just our own birth rate, our population would be declining, uh, but we've made that up with, with immigration. And that's true with a lot of Europe too, until the immigration becomes so prominent that people say, you know, they get all right wing and, and they want to build their own fences to immigration. So it, it gets unsettling. But I mean, the, the trend in most of these developed nations is that family size is so small, uh, like Korea and China, are both expected to have one half the population they do today by the year 2100. And I imagine what that's gonna do for everything, having half as many people as you currently have. And so there are some economists who, who are trying to think about what, how you plan for that, because you know, in some ways, all of our social security systems are based on a, on a population pyramid that a lot of young people support to retired older people. And it is kind of a Ponzi scheme, you know? But when the population starts looking like this, you've got very few people supporting all those older people. It's an issue. And I mean, the ultimate answer there, according to people I've talked to is, hey, robots. <laughs> You're gonna have robots doing all the work and tending all these you know, 80 year old people wandering around. I mean, these are just huge, huge problems. And, but the fact is in China so far, I don't know how this will play out in the coming years, but when they lifted that from one child, they said, well, you can have as many as you want. Yeah, people don't want to have a lot of large family, even now, even when they can. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating problem. I mean, I, hell, I'll go ahead and say it. I've always thought that the ideal conservation solution for our planet is for the human population to go down below 1 billion. And once we've reached 1 billion, we can call it a success. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question is always which is the one billion that remains and uh, if it's your family or someone else's family that's the difficulty but yeah well, thanks <laughs> I, I got two kids and two stepkids and I only have so I have a four next generation offspring and only two grandchildren so I'm not going to my family won't be here so that's fine <laughs> uh, I'm glad to give up my land to the lions that's fine <laughs> thank, thank you Marty thank you Craig I've just uh, been gleaming uh, some of the uh, comments out of the uh, out of the comment box, and there was a question raised about uh, essentially uh, carbon footprints and uh, destruction done with chemicals, fertilizers, and big factory farm agriculture. Um, so if we can touch on that, and then um, I I've got a question that then sort of maybe we could uh, have a look at a little bit. And that is, what about insect um, insect uh, proteins uh, being introduced into, into the food system for humans? Yeah, well, insect proteins, that would be a great example. You get much more yield per hectare. I mean, that would be great. Um, Man-eating bugs, that would be fantastic. As far as uh, the carbon footprint, so again, these factory farms, and that's for meat. And, you know, that's, that's grain-fed meat. That's taking away food from people, feeding it to cows, concentrating all that urine and feces, and you got a huge mess. So uh, I personally am, uh, I'm fine with free-range cattle, uh, particularly, you know, when I go to Kenya or Namibia or Botswana, because yeah, it's fine. That's what you, that's how you get food out of the land. It's the grain fed beef that's the problem. And so I think anything that can reduce that, I mean, there are a lot of subsidies that Western governments have towards agriculture. And if you got rid of some of those subsidies, those things would be le much less profitable. And in, far, in terms of uh, large scale farming for uh, crops, it's the monocultures that are really massively a problem uh, that's, that's contributing to bee extinctions and all kinds of other things. But again, if you have a more sensible, as the Chinese are, are starting to do, and there are other programs like this around the world, 
intercropping, mixed cropping, all these things, uh, and a less reliance on grains. Grains are staples that sit on shelves for a long time. So the food industry loves putting those in packages and calling them different names, cereal, crackers, whatever, pet food. But if you if you grow more broccoli, you know, that's 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 a good thing. <laughs> but the the point of all of this is that uh, how how the land gets used, there are ways forward. We have seen trends. I didn't show it in my presentation, but if you look at the um, yield per hectare as a function of um, the amount of nitrogen going on the land, it looks like the Nike swoosh. So it goes up at first. So you need more in, more inputs means more uh, yield. Okay, more fertilizer, more crop coming up. But then what we've seen in France, the U.S., even Mexico, is it starts going like this. So people are reducing the amount of nitrogen they're putting on it, and yet their yields are continuing to go up. So there are some positive trends that are less damaging to the environment than than what we are used to from the last uh, like 10 to 30 years ago. Cool. Um, Anthony, I see your hands up again. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, Craig, I just sort of thought of another question now, now that the topic of um, uh, insects came up. Mm -hmm. And now, yeah, I, I'm going to sort of step away for a moment from this broader discussion of uh, global impacts on, on um, the future of wildlife and everything. I want to just go back to the first part of your presentation where you said um, in areas of, of uh, sort of higher um, human population densities, those are the areas, the, like the conservancies and reserves around those areas, those are the like focus areas where fencing needs to be put and, and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, I just wanted to get your take. Do, do, do you, I mean, in your study, did you, did you consider um, the effects of different kind of uh, fencing, the effects different uh, types of fences would have? Because I mean, obviously you can have your stock standard uh, Bonox fence or electric fence or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um that's just a physical structure that keeps animals in and stops them from from getting out but you can also have things like um i know in kenya and some areas they've done it they've they make fences using beehives um they they uh, plant stakes in the in the ground at a certain distance between and and they're they're filled with uh Hives of a of a bee, which the that works very well for elephants um, in some areas, and I suppose not in others. So you get things like that. There's also more research coming through now, um, where where I don't know in in what sort of time frame it might um, occur, but some years down the line we might be able to have um, sort of uh, uh, biological means of deterring uh, predators like lions and leopards, where we could um, employ the, the, the use of scent against those sort of uh, predatory species, um, basically uh, imitating a sort of scent mark on the ground, spraying it in a sort of delineation to detract, to, to deter them rather from a area. So with innovations like that, do you think, well, what is your, I mean, take on how that would affect um, the need for fencing in those areas. Well, there may be future innovations that would be really great. Uh, the, uh, the, and, and our, our paper, I, actually I could say a little bit more about that paper. We looked at, uh, we used the sort of standard South African elephant proof, lion proof fence with electrical, all that. And we estimated how much it would cost. That, that map, I, I kind of went through that part of the talk quite briefly, but we found there was something like 12,000 kilometers of fencing across all of Africa would, would help protect against those really highest conflict areas. Uh, and the cost of erecting that fence and then maintaining it would more than pay for itself in reduced crop damages and reduced livestock losses. So we had estimates of annual cost to livestock, annual cost to crops. 
And these fences would pay for themselves and they're already hard boundaries. And so I think the problem with having a, a biological barrier like uh, bee fences, I, as it happened, I was just talking to somebody from uh, Kenya yesterday. The problem with the bee fence is bees are only active in the day. And elephants quickly mm. learn that the best time to raid a crop is at night. Mm. Also, bees don't go out when it rains. Elephants learn that, great, they can go raid the crops when it's raining. So yeah. they don't really work uh, as much as they're often touted. And yeah. with scent marks and things, I've not seen any data that say that would really keep a hungry lion away from livestock on the other side of the, nothing. So, I mean, there might be something that comes forward, uh, but I think, you know, the experience that we have is that, that if these fences are built properly and well-maintained, they will work and you have a barrier. And if you, if you have a solution, then fine, then get rid of the fence and, and do something else. But until then, that seems like the best solution for that 12,000 kilometers across all of Africa. And as I said, they wouldn't have that in um, you know, most, a lot of Southern Africa. And in fact, we, we mapped out with, I didn't show it in this, I should have, uh, but in South Africa, uh, some of the fences down there, they're not necessary according to our analysis. Now, the South Africans might disagree with that because everybody's used to it. But I mean, like next to Bushbuck Ridge, you know, next to Kruger, obviously that's a hard boundary and you, you can't have yeah. lions coming in in the middle of the night. I mean, there have been times in, because Nairobi Park has a fence and sometimes it's not well maintained and the lions go into people's neighborhoods at night and it's, no. <laughs> but again, I mean, technology may find something for it, but I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Um, and thank you, Craig, for the answer. Um, so one of the questions, that, okay, and I'd just also like to add a, add a bit of a comment to the fencing situation, because I deal with Kruger's fencing every now and again. And it's not in. It's not the condition that uh, we would all think it is in. Um, it's a. It's a well-known fact that we've got wild dogs uh, that den outside of the park and move back into the park, hunt, and then go and feed their their pups outside until the whole pack can move again, and then then they move back into the park. And the reason they do that is is they're trying to avoid their arch enemy in the form of lions. Um, so fences are, are, are often built to keep people out and not so effective in keeping wildlife in. Um, but having said that, it's a talk that, or it's something that we will be covering um, in our um, share screen uh, program uh, later on in the year. Uh, where we look at wildlife security again, and part of that will be looking at fortress conservation, which is a dominant conservation model in the South African context. And also just to talk on uh, talk to the uh, scent uh, marking stuff we did have on Unlocking Nature, we had a talk by uh, Dr. Peter Apps, um, where a lot of work has been done um, to, to uh, look at scent marking and how uh, how that could be used in terms of preventing uh, potential conflict situations between um, humans and wildlife. And then I would like to go to another question or comment is, um, we've uh, some time was spent uh, looking at the, the way um, technology might evolve um, to address the needs of uh, a growing human population um, and deal with with, the, uh, with, with um, our, our needs as a, as a global um, community. But there is also uh, an element out there that is uh, now talking about GMO this and GMO that and they're anti-GMO. And essentially the only way we're going to see any form of, um, of uh, uptake towards uh, making the current land that we've got available to and to us uh, rather than going towards the three and a half thousand hectares on that slide is going to is going to be to look at gen genetically modified options and and options that can deal with potential climate change situations and varying uh, changing conditions 
how do we how do we deal with that and dovetail it into dealing with with the needs of 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 I guess a middle class um, that is uh, starting to kick back against a genetically modified crop. Well, I think um, there's two genetically modified things that I can mention that I think are or three actually uh, that are very encouraging and then i'll get to the the political acceptance of it later first is that um, photosynthesis is amazingly inefficient <laughs> it converts something like two percent of the sun's energy into carbohydrates and so there are a number of labs around the world tinkering with photosynthesis and uh, so if you could raise that even just to three percent four percent you get massive increase in productivity from the same area, you know, that would be truly transformational. Another one uh, is um, there's uh, some genetically modified potatoes that for the same amount of water, same amount of land, same amount of nutrients, massive potatoes, okay? And then, um, I forget the third one, but that's enough. <laughs> but I wanna give the example of golden rice because golden rice uh, is basically a, a genetically modified rice that brought in the genetics of a daffodil that would then put beta carotene into rice. And so you're putting vitamin A into the staple food uh, in countries that are deficient in vitamin A. The, the deficiency of vitamin A causes middle retardation, stunting it's bad you know hundred thousand people a year can buy, die from that and so when the genetically modified golden rice was uh, introduced to i think it was the philippines or somewhere um it was fine everybody did it but then it turned out they hadn't actually talked to people they hadn't actually said hey this is an experimental plant this is genetically modified. It takes the gene of a daffodil. It puts it into rice. Do you have permission? Do we, can we have your permission as parents to allow your children to eat this? They didn't do that. And so when it came out that their children were being used as guinea pigs by a bunch of genetic engineers from the West, blah. so a lot of it, I think, is you know, again, it comes back as people have kind of been talking about other talks and things, really engaging with local communities, really engaging with people, uh, you know, following all the proper protocols. And, you know, like right now, every time in the US, if I like eat a corn chip or something, it's all genetically modified. That's all we have over here. And, you know, I know that in, in Africa, there were a number of African countries that resisted the importation of some genetically modified, but I think those have been dropped. And so there may be people who still resist it, but in terms of feeding large numbers of people, I suspect that as we go forward, uh, there will be more and more acceptance. So the third one I forgot is drought resistance. So there's a number of, of attempts to make uh, plants so they can not die when there's not enough water, they wait till it finally rains and then they recover. So that, that's another thing that's being bred into some of these crops. So those things, especially as, as I mean, in that worst case scenario, uh, I think people, uh, there, will, there will be people who will eat it, even if it's just Americans and we export the non-GMOs somewhere else. But I, I think there will be inevitably more acceptance of it. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the uh, in the room that would like to ask uh, Craig a question directly? Okay, so there are a lot of comments, lots of comments in the um, um, in the chat, um, and those comments largely, I think, have been covered in the way we have. Um, 
we've covered uh, the questions. I think that we've pretty much answered the majority or, or, or had a look at each one of those items that has been commented on. Uh, one thing that I will say, uh, Craig, is, is that um, Marit will be putting you in touch with Ian uh, Redmond so that the two of you can have a conversation. I'd just like to say on behalf of uh, LCA Unlocking Nature, thank you, Craig, for an, a phenomenal presentation. It is hugely informative uh, based on the questions and the um, the comments that we've uh, had in the um, in in the comment box or the uh, the chat box this evening. Uh, there's a lot of engagement, and we've touched on various subjects um, from wars in Europe to um, to trade routes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that there's there's a a definite need to to maybe sit and revisit this topic at a later stage again because uh, i think that it's um covered a lot of uh, ground